I'm Shane Morris. Thanks for listening to the Breakpoint Podcast. As part of our continuing series on the concept of calling, we present John Stone Street's interview with Patrick Wright, Thomas C. Vanderveer Bicentennial Chair at the University of South Carolina's Darla Moore School of Business. Wright, who is a graduate of our Colson Fellows Program, discusses his calling to academia, particularly to the challenge of teaching as a Christian at a public university. Here are John Stone Street and Patrick Wright. Well, welcome everybody to the Breakpoint Podcast. We've been doing a series over the last couple of weeks in preparation for the Wilberforce Weekend. By the way, if you're not signed up for the Wilberforce Weekend, we've got an incredible lineup. It's May 18th through the 20th in Washington, D.C. You don't want to miss it. Eric Metaxas is going to be there. Johnny Erickson Todd is going to be there. Andrew Peterson is going to be there. And the list goes on and on. And I will be there, uh, as well as the, the other Colson Center staff, people that you hear on the Breakpoint Podcast, Shane Morris, Warren Smith. Uh, you'll want to join us. It's kind of like our annual family reunion. And the theme this year for the Wilberforce Weekend is the theme of calling. Now, you've heard me say this on past episodes. When I was growing up, to be called by God to a job was to uh, to be called to the mission field or to be called to be a pastor. Uh, John Stott once talked uh, about kind of how we think about calling. He says, you know, we, we tell kids that if they're really spiritual, they'll be a missionary. If they're not quite as spiritual, they'll be a pastor. And if they're they're really backslidden, they're going to business or worst of all, politics. Well, we've got one of those really bad backslidden guys here as a guest on the Breakpoint Podcast to prove to all of us uh, that calling is not just uh, the kind of the traditional church jobs, but that all of life because it's under the Lordship of Jesus Christ, uh, is a place of calling uh, for, for people of faith. And I'm pleased to welcome as my guest to talk about uh, his journey and his call, Patrick Wright. Patrick Wright is the Thomas Van Diver Bicentennial Chair at the University of South Carolina, Darla Moore School of Business. He teaches and conducts research and consults in the area of strategic human resource management. Um, in fact, since 2011, he has been named by Human Resource Management Magazine as one of the 20 most influential thought leaders in uh, HR. Uh, And in 2014, won the SHRM's Michael Losey Award for HR Research. He's really excelling in his field. Now, I got to know Pat just over the last couple uh, months or so, uh, having reconnected with him. Pat went through the what was called at one time the Centurions Program. Right now, it's called the Colson Fellows Program. Pat went through that. For those of us who don't know at home, the Centurions Program was founded by Chuck Colson to kind of send uh, local Christian leaders on a deep dive into Christian worldview and cultural renewal. And uh, it was called Centurions. When Chuck passed away, we renamed it after Chuck. It's now called the Colson Fellows. At the Wilberforce Weekend, we'll be commissioning 160 Colson Fellows uh, from this latest class. But you went through the program back when it was called Centurions. Uh, What year was that, Pat? Yeah, it was uh, 2009. I was a C5, as we used to refer to it, the fifth class. That's great. And so you had a chance to interact with Chuck Colson uh, personally. And, and so you and I hopped on the phone a couple weeks ago, and I just thought, you know what? I want people to, to hear kind of how you have taken this kind of concept that God has placed and called you uh, in a particular situation, both in your professional life, but also in your engagement with your community and, and, and in your church, uh, and, and, and how that's kind of moved forward. So it, it, it's really exciting. Plus, I always love to hear uh, when Colson Fellows or Centurions are living out. Uh, what it was they spent a whole year investing in, and it's really shaped the direction of their life. I mean, is that an accurate statement? Would you say that the going through the Centurion program uh, w- was a defining uh, time of study for you? Oh, absolutely. I mean, and it's uh, certainly I was a Christian long before that, and you know, serving the Lord in different ways. But uh, I think that going through the Colson uh, process really helped me to do a much better job of integrating my faith with what I was doing, what I was, uh, the, the work I was doing, the research I was conducting, uh, the, the, the kinds of courses I was teaching. Um, it was a, a, just a transformational time in my life to really rethink, you know, what was my calling um, and how could I use the gifts that God had given me in a way that would benefit His kingdom. Um, and again, uh, in, in a place that's not the mission field uh, as we tend to think of it, and it's not pastoring a church. Uh, but it's actually in a university setting. 
You know, last week we had Steve Green on the podcast. Steve is the CEO of Hobby Lobby. His dad, David Green, is the founder of Hobby Lobby. David has a similar story where, uh, you know, a preacher's kid, uh, all of his brothers and sisters, you know, went into kind of our traditional understanding of the ministry as a pastor or missionary. And David kind of felt like, uh, at least according to Steve, his dad really felt like the black sheep uh, because he didn't go into traditional ministry. Did did you have that sense uh, kind of as you uh, emerged out of college, chose a career that you were kind of doing less than the, than the, than the Lord's work? Actually, it's kind of funny when you mention that. I, I didn't feel that way, uh, but, but uh, I graduated from Wheaton College with a psych, uh, psychology major, and I forget it was my 15-year or 20-year reunion, uh, one of those big reunions. I remember going back to the Wheaton College reunion, and it was just kind of, uh, that's where it became really apparent to me that you know, the people that were missionaries, that were pastors, you know, everyone gathered around them like, oh my gosh, you're really serving God. And, you know, here I was, you know, a chaired professor at an Ivy League university, and, and it was kind of like, oh yeah, you're just working, I guess. Um, and so I think that's probably <laughs> the best example of, of you know, the, the way the, the, the kind of church community sometimes really uh, creates that perception that if you're not a pastor or a missionary, you're, you're in some lesser profession. Well, talk a little bit about how you settled then on this call. I mean, coming out of Wheaton, I mean, you know, you so you're a weedy. I love to call people that, uh, you know. Absolutely. But I, yeah, I graduated from a Christian college as well, and and there really is that kind of unspoken. A lot of times, that unspoken hierarchy, and and I say that even at the college where I graduated, where you know, my many of my professors tried to intentionally uh, counter uh, that kind of dualistic dichotomy between the sacred and the secular. But it, but it just kind of emerges, right? It just kind of emerges uh, when you – some jobs are kind of more, you know, trendy or or whatever, I guess, than others in Christian terms. Uh, so what was your journey like? To, to, to when, when did you sense, like, well, you know what, there's there's actually a calling on my life uh, to, 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 to be a business professor in the academy? I mean, that's, a, that, that's an interesting place to land. Well, you know, actually, I'll, I'll say there are kind of two stages to my professional career. The first one was moving into, um, you know, getting my Ph.D. in, in business uh, in organizational behavior and human resource management. Um, when I told my, my, my mom had been a state senator, state representative, state senator in Arizona for 20-some years, when I told her that I was going to get a Ph.D., she wanted me to promise that I would not go into academe. Uh, because she was always so frustrated with the professors that would write her nasty letters um, with misspellings and grammatical errors and so on. Um, but uh, and, and actually, when I went in, I thought, you know, probably I want to get my Ph.D. and go into consulting. Uh, but the more I got into the, the kind of research side and the teaching side of, of the Ph.D. program, the more I really found that I, I loved doing that. I loved the, the research um, from the standpoint of, I, I remember my uh, dissertation chair saying, you know, when I teach, I only teach, but when I do research, I learn. Um, mm-hmm. And that research process was a great learning process for me, where you're trying to discover what is truth, um, or as close as you can come to it. But I also enjoyed teaching. I, I enjoyed being kind of in the front of the, of the classroom, having an Im- impact on students. And so when I graduated from my PhD program, I went to Notre Dame for a couple of years, to Texas A&M for seven years. Uh, on to Cornell for 16 years, and then I've been, uh, you know, at, at uh, South Carolina for six years now. Um, and really up until about halfway through my time at Cornell, it was very, you know, kind of ambitious, um, you know, the, the publisher parish, getting all of those, those research publications, um, trying to uh, build, you know, more of a, I guess, a research stream dealing with companies, um, not just for academic journals, um, you know, trying to do a good job in teaching and impacting students. Uh, but uh, I, I hit this point when I was getting ready for a sabbatic, uh, and I knew that the class that I had been teaching uh, pretty regularly, this HR analytics class, was going to go away because we had a new person coming in who was much more uh, competent at teaching that than I was. Um, and I began to think about, so what do I want to do? Well, around that time, I just reviewed an article um, and it was an article from the strategy literature looking at how CEOs make decisions about uh, mergers and acquisitions. And uh, the article was actually kind of interesting because they, they argue that there are two characteristics of CEOs 
that drive dysfunctional decisions with acquisitions. And the first one was opportunism, which they defined as self-interest seeking with guile. And that is that CEOs want to have a bigger company because their paycheck goes up. And that's the one big predictor of CEO pay is how big your company is. And then the second thing that causes dysfunction is this concept of hubris, you know, thinking you're the smartest guy in the room. And the article argued that what happens is they overpay for an acquisition because they think that they're going to be able to make it work. Well, as, as I'm reading this article about the same time in my devotions, I'm reading Philippians 2. And so here's a secular article that's looking at these characteristics of decision-making being you know, this kind of self-interest and, and uh, the, the kind of hubris. Uh, and I'm reading uh, for, uh, Philippians 2, and it says, you know, do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant to your, than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. And I thought, you know, what this research article is discovering is Philippians 2, 3, and 4. Um, and, and the solution is really Philippians 2, 3, and 4, that what motivates a lot of people is this selfish ambition the conceit, the thinking that they know it all, um, and, and Paul is writing to us to say, no, the, the answer is to go the exact opposite direction, to put others' interests uh, above your own, and to have humility in recognizing counting other people as more significant than yourself. Also, at that time is when I discovered the Colson program, uh, the Colson Fellows program, and so I enrolled in that program, and it was just absolutely one year of challenging me intellectually. I had always kind of thought of, you know, most of the stuff I read, whether it was Ravi Zacharias or Chuck Colson, as being more apologetics. And I really developed uh, this deeper knowledge about what worldview is all about and how it impacts the decisions that we make, the way we view um, all of our experiences. Um, and so uh, that, that actually gave me my assignment um, solved a bunch of, uh, of problems with, uh, with one program, and that is that when I came back, I began teaching a business ethics class at Cornell. And the ethics class was uh, the first four weeks of it were built on the concepts that I had learned about worldview. And my, my teaching with the students there was, before we can even talk about ethics, you have to understand you know, these different worldviews and what are the implications for ethics. Um, and so I would teach that class uh, just as a theistic worldview versus a naturalistic or, or materialistic worldview, take students through, use uh, movies to illustrate the different concepts. Um, and I remember when I would talk with my wife about it, she would often say, you know, I, I don't want you proselytizing. I don't want you going into the secular classroom and, and preaching at them because I don't like it when people on the other side do the same thing um, just from the opposite perspective. And I tried to play it as straight as possible. Um, and uh, then the last class period, I would make an optional class period and told the students, listen, if you want to know what I believe, come in, I'll tell you what I believe. But up until then, I really just want you to think about, here are these alternative worldviews, and you figure out which one is more productive, more corresponding to reality, and more coherent. Um, and you know, it, 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 I guess I must have done a good job because I remember we had a bunch of students over to our house for dinner one night, and one of the students came up to my wife and she said, you know, really, what does he believe? <laughs> uh, that made my wife feel a lot better that I wasn't actually um, preaching in the classroom, um, but really trying to get them to think. But, you know, again, I think that uh, college students in particular um, – they, they're living a life without having really thought through some of their assumptions. And when you take it into that materialist worldview and you really think about the implications of that worldview and how well it really corresponds with your experience and, and how you know, well it fits together and, and what are kind of the productive consequences of that, um, I think a lot of students realize this really does not make a lot of sense. That doesn't mean they'll change their behavior. Um, you know, they're in college. They uh, they w want to kind of live their lives, but uh, uh, but I just found that to be a, a great op opportunity for me, and really that second phase to begin to think about you know how do I really integrate the concepts that I do research on, the concepts that I teach um, with my Christian faith, and and so that's been a tremendous uh, journey since then. My guest today on the Breakpoint Podcast is Patrick Wright, who's a professor at the University of South Carolina, Darla Moore School of Business. In fact, he's the Thomas Van Diver Bicentennial Chair. Uh, but, uh, Pat, I, what I love about that story, uh, and, and, and why I'm so excited you just told it, is that there are these kind of segments of culture that Christians have, I think, 
believed are off limits, right? You you can't bring your faith into university campuses. I mean, university campuses, even in the last five years, have just exploded. And you might even say exploded and crazy. And I want to get back to that in just a second. But but I remember once in, in Nashville, Tennessee, uh, the teacher of an AP honors English class at a local public high school talked about kind of the same sort of thing and how she taught worldview to her students in a public school at AP English. English, just comparing, for example, you know, Brave New World, you know, with another book from another worldview and another book from a Christian, you know, and, and maybe Mere Christianity or Screw Tape Letters or something like that. And just basically just saying he, that worldviews exist. And, you know, going to business ethics, first of all, most business ethics courses are, you know, hey, what do you think about this ethical dilemma? And whatever you think is naturally good, there's no grounding in any sort of kind of logical, consistent worldviews or or being able to justify why we ethically choose what we what we choose, uh, but 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 also it's just this idea that so many Christians have that they can't take their faith to work, and what you've just proven is is one of the places where it's supposed to be most off limits, right? The secular university, state schools, uh, you, you know, you just prove that you can take your faith to work. Not only you can, but it actually helps you do your work better, not just personally and privately, but even in how you kind of ground. Uh, what you teach. Why do we have this idea uh, that we can't take our faith with us in our public lives? Well, I mean, again, I think that particularly, and, and this was my wife's concern, right, is that, um, you know, you're in a public university, you're, you're not in a Christian college. And, you know, I have, being a Wheaton graduate, I am a big proponent of Christian colleges. Um, but I just feel like God has called me into a secular university setting, uh, because there are a number of Christians there that are, have their faith challenged on a regular basis. You know, they come in, they're, you know, told there is no God and, 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 uh, you know, told that there's just a material world. And, um, I think they have the temptations that come from being away from their parents, uh, that kind of lead them often into, you know, wanting to, to chuck their Christian faith. Um, you know, there is this psychological concept called cognitive dissonance that you, you can't hold two competing thoughts in your head at the same time. And I think, you know, students come in, they begin to get into alcohol and sex, and, you know, they've been raised as Christians, and they look at it and they say, well, these two things can't be, they can't both be true at the same time. Therefore, I like what I'm doing on the the uh, alcohol and sex thing, so I'll chuck the, the uh, Christian thing for a while. Um, I, I really want to be able to touch those students, you know, particularly through my church, as, as almost an inoculation of this is what you're going to face, and these are the temptations you're going to have. But keep in mind, this is what worldview is all about. This is this is the coherent and, and kind of productive worldview. And, you know, recognizing some of them are going to take a time of, of uh, you know, kind of going off on their own. Um, but at the end of that process, they'll come back to the faith that they had before. Now, in the classroom, um, I, you know, I don't have any concern uh, with, with sharing who I am at all. In fact, I tell the students um, when we go through our orientation with our master's students, and, and we want them to have a point of view about um, HR and, and how it impacts the business. And they say, listen, my point of view is I believe that you know, all people are made in the image of God, and be, because of that, their due dignity and respect, and that that's how we should be treating people in organizations. You can debate with me about that. You can say I'm completely wrong. All I'm doing is expressing my opinion. Um, this is my point of view. You can have a completely different point of view. And I think um, as, as long as we're not you know, necessarily beating people over the heads with, with the Bible and saying you have to believe this, but simply arguing um, from a, a rational basis and stating opinions and, and perspectives, uh, I think this, the secular university is a great place for that. That's really what the university was meant to do, was to provide a, a platform where people could come and hear competing ideas and learn from those competing ideas and develop their own view of the world. No, I think that's right. In fact, just recently we did a, a commentary on Christian colleges, and you mentioned Christian colleges, and just the enormous pressure that they're facing. We, we, what, what I said in the commentary was both from without and from within, and and part of the the, the tragedy of uh, you know the the struggles that Christian college faces is that there's such an opportunity uh, to really provide a broad based education, and there's the, you know secular schools have a reputation right now, and it's not a good reputation by and large, uh, not 
got a reputation for being a place where you can honestly debate ideas, where, you know, some views are just considered off limits from the very beginning and not just kind of racist, bigoted ideas. But if you call an idea racist or bigoted, immediately it has no place uh, to go. I mean, we, we all saw last year what happened at Evergreen State University and uh, all kinds of other places. You've got a situation right now in higher education where political correctness often takes precedence over learning. Uh, this idea of intersectionality uh, replaces uh, truth. Uh, and, and you see incidents like what happened at recently at Berkeley, what's happened at Evergreen State University and other places. Um, and, 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 and you're a Christian professor uh, or a professor who is a Christian called to a state school. I mean, how do you, what kind of grade do you give the state of higher education in America? And, and specifically in light of that challenge, what do you see as your calling? Well, so, so let me begin with being at South Carolina. We're, uh, you know, we are kind of the middle of the Bible belt. Um, and, and so we have not seen as much of the crazy stuff here as, as necessarily, you know, on, on either of the coasts. Um, certainly not uh, when I was on the faculty at Cornell. We saw a lot of craziness there. Um, however, you know, again, looking at higher education as a whole, you're exactly right. And, and that is that um, it, it, the, the, the whole purpose of the university, again, is the idea of unity and diversity. Um, and so how do we create, you know, this kind of uh, unified um, body where people can be um, exposed to diverse ideas? Um, I, I really hate to say it, but I think it's the, the kind of cowardice of some of the administrators um, who are afraid to take a stand. And, you know, that's why I, I loved um, that uh, the article, you know, this is not a daycare center, because I think that was um, laying down really – uh, what a university is supposed to be about. Um, I know the, I believe it's the University of Chicago has done the same thing where they put together a statement of, you know, here's what the university is about. So, you know, if you're going to be offended by things, then this is not the right place for you. Um, so there are, I, I think, lights out there of, of universities are taking that stand uh, for the traditional you know, liberal view of what a university is supposed to be about. Those uh, I commend those I would love to see more and more universities imitate, um, but I think that you know, in a political environment where uh, you know, university presidents have to worry about state funding and, and you know, all of the kind of backlash that could come, I think it's just easy for that, easier for them to give in uh, to, to people that are protesting uh, than to really take a stand. It, it, and, and so, again, it's, I don't want to call it cowardice, but it, it's essentially um, the, the weakness of administrators to stand up, for, and, and not against what these students are saying, but for what the ideal of a university is. Well, the sort of intentionality and forward thinking that you've heard from Dr. Patrick Wright today on the Breakpoint podcast is indicative of uh, the genius behind the Colson Fellows program as Chuck Colson imagined it. Uh, in fact, he believed two things. Number one is you don't know something unless you teach it. And number two, you don't know something unless you've got a plan to actually live it out. And both of those are inherent components to the Colson Fellows uh, training. And by the way, right now we're taking applications for uh, the Colson Fellows program. You can join the next class, which will begin late summer of 2018. Uh, our current class will be commissioned uh, at the uh, Wilberforce Weekend in Washington, D.C., May 18th uh, through the 20th. So take some time to seriously consider whether God is calling you uh, to, to apply this sort of intentional time and this sort of intentional planning to living out your faith in the public square. I'm so grateful for people like Dr. Patrick Wright who have embraced this idea that Christ is Lord of all and is bringing Christ into places where, again, we're told that he doesn't belong. Uh, in his case, the Darla Moore School of Business at the University of South Carolina. Uh, Pat, it's been a, a pleasure to speak with you. Um, thanks so much for how you're continuing to serve uh, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, how you're applying uh, the Colson Fellows training uh, and for taking time to, uh, to speak with us here on the Breakpoint Podcast. Well, thanks so much, John, and I admire all the work you're doing with the Colson Center and just uh, urge you to keep it up. I think it's fantastic stuff. Thanks for listening to the Breakpoint Podcast. For more information on how you can take what John called a deep dive into Christian worldview by joining the Colson Fellows Program, please come to colsonfellows.org. Also, be sure to sign up for next month's Wilberforce Weekend with great speakers like Johnny Erickson Tata, Andrew Peterson, Eric Metaxas, and more. Information is at wilberforceweekend.org.